Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our ATBC webinar on biotic interactions in tropical systems. Um, uh, this webinar is part of our 2020 ATBC webinar series on tropical biology and conservation. We've uh, had some really great webinars so far that have covered topics ranging from professional skills um, in tropical biology, career uh, tips, challenges, and opportunities. We've discussed writing skills. We had a fantastic session on communicating science to diverse audiences. And today we're going to be talking about um, something kind of a uh, really central to what we do here, which is understanding a little bit about um, biotic interactions and in particular interactions between herbivores um, and plants. Um, my name is Emilio Bruna. I'm a professor at the University of Florida and the president-elect of the ATBC. And um, I am your co-host today uh, with Professor Liza Kamita. Liza? Hi, I'm Liza Kamita. I'm an associate professor of tropical forest ecology at the School of the Environment at, at Yale University. And I'm super excited to be here and hear these great talks. Thanks, Liza. Um, so explaining the origin and maintenance of the remarkable diversity that we all know and love in the tropics is really a fundamental theme of what we do as a discipline. And bionic interactions have really uh, been thought to play a central role in promoting speciation in tropical systems, and in particular in um, plant and um, animal systems. Um, and recent uh, advances in things like informatics, phylogenetics, um, genomics, as well as detailed observations of natural history and some really careful experiments. And let's not forget the really invaluable work of uh, taxonomists and the people who are responsible for museum collections um, have resulted in some really fascinating answers to what might seem initially to be a really old question, which is, you know, where did all these species come from and how do they persist in tropical ecosystems? Um, but th what they've also done is really reveal how much we really have to learn about this very fundamental question. Um, today, I'm really excited because we're going to be hearing from three of the experts that are responsible for some of the biggest and most interesting and most important breakthroughs on this core topic. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to turn it over uh, before I do the introduction of our first speaker to Liza, who's going to be telling us a little bit about some of the general logistics for the webinar. Is that right, Liza? Yep. Do you want to share that slide? Excellent. So for those of you that have not attended a Zoom webinar, we're just going to provide some instructions. So you might already be able to tell that your microphones and your videos are not activated as webinar attendees. Um, you'll only be able to see the speakers and the moderators. However, you are able to and welcome to submit questions through the question and answer tab, the Q&A button that you see next to the chat button, which will be disabled. And you're welcome to submit questions at any point during the talks. We're gonna go through all three talks first and then have the Q&A session afterwards, but you're welcome to begin submitting questions through that Q&A tab as soon as they pop into your head. Um, the chat function, again, is only activated to panelists. And if you encounter any technical issues, please email the addresses that you see here, communications at tropicalbio.org and director at tropicalbio.org and we'll try and get you um, back in as quickly as possible. Um, so as, as soon as you have questions, um, please feel free to enter them into that Q&A tab and Emilio and I will take turns reading off those questions to the panelists. So it is now my pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Diego Salazar Amoretti. He is originally from Costa Rica and a graduate of the University of Costa Rica, where he studied botany and ecology. He then went on to earn a PhD at the University of Missouri St. Louis, where he studied how chemically mediated plant herbivore interactions shape species rich plant communities under the su supervision of Dr. Bob Marquis. His dissertation focused on Hyper, with fieldwork that took him from Mexico to Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And after a postdoc at UC Berkeley, where he began to study the evolution of chemical diversity in the tree genus Proteum, he moved to Miami, where he is currently an assistant professor at Florida International University 
and also runs the Plant Chemical Ecology Lab as part of the International Center for Tropical Botany, a partnership between Florida International University and the National Tropical Botanical Garden. We're really excited he's able to join us today and share his insights on practical approaches to incorporate plant chemical defenses in studies of plant-animal interactions. Diego, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Liza. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, like Liza said, uh, my name is Diego Salazar Boretti, and I work at Florida International University. And I'm super excited today to share with you guys uh, some practical approaches to incorporate chemical ecology uh, to, to projects. Uh, the idea is that this talk should serve as an inspiration for um, some of the young researchers that have thought about doing something like that, but might think it might be too complicated. Uh, but nonetheless, I want to start with some introduction of the of those uh, more important uh, findings that uh, with uh, me, my collaborators, and other scientists have been able to find on this field and how it intertwines with this big question that Emilio was talking about, which is the the create the forging and the maintenance of uh, tropical biodiversity. Give me one second to share my screen so we can get started. Okay, here we go. So, uh, for those of you that have seen my talks in the past, you'll know that I always like to start with some kind of historical uh, uh, component. And today I want to start with James Cook. Well, so James Cook, this guy in the picture right there, he, he was a very famous British explorer. And so he, he did these three big major exploration trips across the Pacific, uh, where he was mainly trying to find uh, a mythical continent in the southern part of the globe uh, called in those days Terra Australis. And so he traveled where no man from Europe had ever gone before and uh, trying to look for this place, which he, he, he actually never found. He found what today is called Australia, mainly because of this relationship with this Terra Australis that he was actually looking for. Um, and so um, he had this port in what now it's called uh, Sydney, or they use as a base. And botany for for him and for the members of their expedition was so important that this base, this beautiful safe bay, they use as a base for all their explorations, even today is still called Botany Bay, right there south of Sydney. Yeah? And so uh, in every one of his trips, he always had uh, famous naturalists uh, going along. And for his second trip, he had Johan and Gregor uh, Foster two German uh, father and son couple that um, had the job of recording and cataloging all the biodiversity they were encountering this second trip. After the trip, they went and wrote a book called A Voyage Round the World. And in this book, we see for the first time the description of noun, a well-known pattern, the pattern of the latitudinal diversity gradient is this pattern that says that as you move closer to the equator, yes, you start to find more um, species packed into the same amount of area and with a higher diversity of taxonomical groups. And so th this was the origin of it all. So th this is the first time uh, people start talking about the great diversity that we find in tropical systems. And so to this day, scientists have really, really gone far and beyond to try to understand these mechanisms that forge and maintain this amazing pattern. And they're still not fully understood, but we've made huge strides on, on getting there. Um, so for me, this is, this is a core question and it, it, it kind of fuels everything that I've done and I keep doing. And it's how can so many species coexist in this apparent equilibrium when you go to the forest and you see them all right there. And so um, in, the, in recent years, what we've learned is that plant chemical defenses and herbivores are likely to play an important role. Of course, there's many, many other things that are had to be important for the mechanisms that forge and maintain this biodiversity. But it's clear now that uh, plant chemistry and the way it modulates plant herbivore interactions might be an important component of uh, these mechanisms that facilitate species coexistence. Uh, for example, here's a great paper from last year from Dale Forrester, Maria Jose Endara, uh, Philly Scully, Tom Corsar, which is a great paper where they work in, uh, in data from Barro Colorado and they show that um, 
Herbivores and plant chemistry are two of the most important components that keep abundant species at bay from reaching high abundances in the field and thus allowing uh, rare species to have some kind of competitive advantage in you know, natural settings. And so that's, that's, that's an interesting evidence. One evidence that comes from, from our work uh, with Piper is that uh, a few years ago we did this Piper community experiment where we went to the field and we built these 64 experimental communities uh, made out of different combination of 17 different species of Piper. This was a big experiment with more than 1600 Piper plants where we manipulated in each community uh, the species richness, phylogenetic diversity, and chemical diversity. So each community was rich or poor in one of these components of diversity. Some had a lot of species, some had a few, some were phylogenetically complex, some were phylogenetically phylogenetically simple, some were chemically complex, and some were chemically simple. And in this fully factorial design, we're set up to kind of tell the difference on the effect of each of these components of diversity. After more than a year of running the experiments, we went back and we gathered data. And here are a couple of plots from the data we gather. Every point and cross in these plots equals to one Piper community. This is not a Piper species, this is a Piper community. And so, uh, we measure local mortality in the communities and local extinction, and we learned that the most important component that reduced mortality and extinction in these communities was the chemical diversity of the community. Communities with a higher chemical diversity had significantly lower mortality and extinction. Now, a lot of times in biology, we say significantly more, significantly less, but this time I'm talking significantly. We're talking about around 20% less mortality when you had chemically diverse communities. So chemistry, it's important for coexistence, no doubt. There's a clear relationship between plant chemical diversity and plant uh, and herbivore diversity at the community level. Um, and so the, the truth of the matter is tropical systems are complex. Yeah? And so uh, a lot of times we like to think about uh, plant herbivore interactions that are modulated by chemistry in a very directional and, and monotonic way in which we have one herbivore, one compound, one species of plant. Yeah? But the truth is it's, it's a very complex system where plants produce hundreds of compounds and are uh, normally threatened by dozens, if not hundreds of different species, the ones that eat them and the ones that potentially could eat them. Yes? And so um, we like to imagine species interactions <laughs> like the picture in the left, like a cavalier battle, but the honest truth is that in the field, it might be a very, very different picture where it's more like a, like a big battle with very few rules that we can discern you know, at, at first glance. Um, let me give you this example. This is a work that I did with uh, Paul Fine, the, the, um, the very smart guy that is going to have the next talk. Um, and so here we have plotted the phylogeny of a group of plants, Proteum, that's a, that's a tree from the, the Amazon forest. And in the other side, we see the phylogeny of the herbivores that eat them. And I have connected all of them based on their feeding interactions. And you can see that there is no clear distinction. There is a very huge amount of information here that it's really, really hard to disentangle. And if to this we add an, a third component, which is the chemistry of the plants, it gets even more complicated. So this is the same graph, it's just we had to split it on three. On the vertical axis, you see the plant chemicals, and on the right axis, you see herbivores, and in the left axis, you see species. And they're connected by their interactions, and the color of the links depends on whether the herbivore is abundant, or is not abundant, or whether the chemical repels or attracts the, the herbivores. The bottom line is that these uh, systems are complex and they're beautiful because they are complex. And so right now uh, there's this huge challenge of really trying to understand these interactions um, by taking into account all this beautiful complexity. Now, uh, in a nutshell, I want to show you a little bit of what I think is behind all this. So in tropical systems, each plant can be attacked by a plethora of herbivores. And here I've put some, some you know, Lepidopterans, but they could be anything. They could be grasshoppers, they could be of different uh, groups, they could be pathogens, they could be bacteria, viruses, fungi. So plants are attacked from left and right, no matter what. 
And so even in very simple systems, you can see that from the data. This is a work from Carlos Garcia Robledo, a good friend, and you can see how these systems that are highly, highly specialized, you still see this uh, complexity and diversity of attacks and interactions between one single plant species and a bunch of different herbivores. And so if you think about it, um, plants could have two different strategies to tackle this diversity of attacks. And these strategies are not exclusive, but there are two different ways in which you can see um, how these systems could work out. So the first strategy is to have highly effective metabolites, something I call silver bullets. Yes, these compounds that are rare, yes, but really, really effective. Um, think about um, something like the one that I have here, uh, piperine. It's, a, it's an alkaloid that is kind of rare in nature. You will only find it in piper, yes, but it's, it's very effective. Yes, um, these kind of compounds will be strong deterg detergent, uh, deterrent against uh, generalist herbivores, yes, but there will be a weak deterrent against specialized herbivores. That's why they're specialized, because they can overcome these specialized defenses, yeah. And so um, here's a good example from the place where I live, South Florida. We have the Kunti, which is a Samia species. And Kunti creates these uh, crazy, crazy rare uh, compounds called asoxy glycosides, which is a very rare kind of alkaloid. And you can see that general herbivores never touch this plant, but uh, it gets completely ravished by specialist herbivores that actually look for these compounds to be sequestered and used as a defense. Yeah, and so it's a rare compound that a lot of cycads produce, but um, it, it serves as a sil silver bullet, but it's not completely effective uh, to specialists. And so we could build a prediction out of this, yes? And that prediction will be that a, a, a groups of plants with a higher diversity of these silver bullets should have a higher diversity of specialized herbivores. Yes, because they're good against general herbivores, but they're weak against specialized herbivores. Do we have evidence for this, I wonder? Well, it just so happens we do. Um, from the work from uh, Laura Richards and their collaborators at Reno, Nevada, uh, they've done a lot of work on the Piper system, who has a lot of these uh, very interesting defenses and alkaloids. And it's a system that is heavily dominated by specialist herbivores. And you can see from their data, that uh, phytochemical diversity, it's positively associated with herbivore diversity. But in this case, most of these herbivores are specialized herbivores. The other alternative is that um, the diversity, um, they could attack with a diversity of compounds. Instead of just silver bullets, they have a diverse chemical arsenal. Yes, I call this everything but the kitchen sink. Yes, and so these plants are producing a huge range of compounds and uh, each one is, is effective to a subset of the herbivores that are likely to attack them. They're common compounds. They're found across the phylogeny uh, of plants, not just that group, but across the phylogeny of plants. We're talking phenolics, terpenoids, we're kind of flavonoids, that kind of stuff. They're weak deterrent against general herbivores because general herbivores, by nature, they're used to these compounds because they're common in nature and they are generalists, yes, and yet, they're relatively strong detergent against specialized herbivores because that's the trade-off. They have to be good at alkalis, but have to be bad at something, yes? And so the, the, the prediction here will be the opposite, that um, the, the diversity, and here I have a typo, I should have put um, generally uh, chemical diversity. So an increase in the chemical diversity of these plants should be negatively associated with the, the diversity of generalist herbivores. Yes, and we do see that pattern again. If we look at proteum, which is a system that is dominated by generalist herbivores, we can see that the higher the chemical diversity, the lower the diversity of these herbivores that we find. And so this is, this is a very um, interesting pattern that we see in nature. And I think it's kind of what is, um, what could be behind these things, but this is something that we're only seeing for two groups of plants. There's a lot we need to study and understand and um, it's important to start incorporating chemistry into exploring the, the diversity of tropical systems and what mechanisms forge them and maintain them, yes? But to do that, we need more researchers, more people exploring uh, these questions. And that's why I wanted to show you guys a bunch of little practical applications that we've been working in my lab and in other labs to to kind of uh, popularize and put a lot of these tools in the hands of um, everyone 
independently of whether you come from a lab that is well-funded or not. Yes, so this is me in Costa Rica in 2001. I have put an arrow there because I'm pretty sure I don't look like that anymore. Yes, but uh, I was once a young student and I was once uh, very um, inspired by by organizations like ATBC. And I remember the first one, I, first time I went to ATBC was such a revelation because I saw this, in, this incredibly huge science and I want to be part of it, but there was a problem. In Costa Rica, we didn't have much money. And so equipment to this kind of stuff was pretty much non-existent at the time. So I didn't have access to GCMSs, HPLCs, NMR, none of that. And so that's what I want to show you guys, that um, there's ways to, to start exploring these questions without the need of this heavily complex equipment. So now I'm going to show you simple practical approaches to incorporate plant chemistry in your projects. Now, there's three kinds that I recommend for anyone if they want to start to do this kind of stuff. Colorimetric approaches, gravimetric approaches, and foam tests. Let's go for the gravimetric approaches. This is pretty simple. You collect the plants, you extract the chemicals. You separate them somehow. Sometimes it's just by separating them with solvents, but it's something anyone can do and it's pretty cheap. You dry those separations and you weigh them, yes? Normally, you cannot tell which compounds you have. You can only tell which group of compounds you have, whether you have terpenoids or phenolics or something like that, but the separation can be done and can be easily done. There's plenty of papers out there to do that. But the question is, is this data good? Well. It is. So this is something we did with Paul Fine again. Yes, this is a simple gravimetric approach where we extracted certain, certain groups of compounds, in this case phenolics, and you can see how this gravimetric approach without any machine involved whatsoever, just a, uh, an analytical balance, you can see an interaction between this data and the um, re species richness of herbivores in these proteum species. So this data, it is useful. It's nothing that, although there's a lot of technology, this is something that everyone can do and it still gives you good data. So that is gravimetric approaches. Now let's talk about colorimetric approaches, approaches based on color. The idea is the same. Collect the sample, do the extraction, do a reaction, yes, which changes the color depending on the presence of certain compounds. Yes, and then you can measure the difference in color Yes, and that gives you data on the abundance of these compounds in your sample. Now, normally you need a spectrophotometer to do that. But in our lab, we said, no, we can do something better. How about we use a cell phone? Yes, and so incredibly enough, cell phones and computers have gone so uh, modernized these days that you can actually do something simple. This is a test for uh, phenolics. Yes, and so we have added falling reagent into these samples and we get the classical blue reaction that indicates the presence of phenolics. And we have different concentrations of phenolics in these vials. We take a picture with a cell phone. This is a picture that I took with my cell phone. This is an iPhone 6 I'm talking about. This is not old, the, the last technology. This is, this is kind of an old cell phone, yes? And as long as you can get a white background and good lighting, you can then crop pieces of each photo and then feed these into one of many freely available apps that can give you a color histogram. Then you can measure the peak of these ones. This, this um, plot right here in, in, in the bottom of the screen is actually the plot from that photo, from that specific photo. Yes, and the cool thing is that you can get really good data out of this. You can create a calibration curve that can transform the data into milligrams of phenolics. Yes, just using a cell phone. Yes, and so this is something we're preparing that hopefully we'll publish soon, but if anyone wants the protocol, we'll be happy to share it. Um, and finally, something called Afrometric tests or foam tests, which goes in the same direction. You collect the samples, you extract, and then you vortex. And so this, these kind of tests are really good for something called saponins, yes, which are really, really strongly active compounds. And saponins, because they're soapy, they, after vortexing, they'll create a foam, yes? And that foam can be measured, yes? And uh, this is work from um, um, Noemi Leon Roque, and they have taken, uh, again, a cell phone and taken pictures of the foam and using a little script on image J to show really good data out of this foam. Yes, so now you can calculate the concentration of total saponins in your, in your plant sample just by using this simple approach. And it's, it's good data, it's good chemistry. The only caveat is that it works mainly when the difference in chemistry 
are big. If the differences in your samples are small, all these approaches are not going to be good enough. But if you're going to compare between species, yes, which is what is kind of fashionable these days, this is a great approach because the difference between species tends to be big. Yes, and so this is something that I think uh, a lot of you guys could try to explore and is mainly what I want to show you guys today to, to inspire you to, to tell you that uh, to start incorporating chemistry in your uh, study of species interactions, especially plantable interactions, is something that can be done uh, independent of funding with just a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of work. So in a nutshell, what I wanted to tell you guys today, and I think I ran too fast through my talk, but no, it doesn't matter. As, uh, in a nutshell, there is a strong link between plant secondary chemistry and plant herbivore diversity. There is. Um, uh, chemistry is the, in, the interface by which species interact, interact ultimately, no matter what. Yeah? And so in order to understand how these species coexist, we need to understand the role that chemistry plays in these interactions and how it evolves and how it keeps things at bay and at equilibrium. And most importantly, we need a new generation of scientists exploring these links of plant chemistry and plant species diversity. And uh, try, try to push forward because if, if this is what interested you, don't think about technology, just think about good ideas, uh, good experimental setups and get them done. And with that, I want to thank you everyone for listening to me, rambling for what seemed to be like 15 minutes. And uh, I thank you all for coming. Diego, that was, yes. just, that was just sensational. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think um, you're gonna get lots of questions afterwards. I got about a half a dozen text messages while you were speaking telling me what a fantastic seminar this was and I uh, took lots of credit for your being here so um, <laughs> you know uh, but really that was wonderful and we have lots of questions that came through and we'll be saving those um, for the end again everybody remember that the Q&A um, button below is where you can post questions and, for all of our speakers and we'll be bringing them together at the end um, to answer them um, with that I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker here uh, who is uh, Paul Fine, Professor Fine, is originally from Michigan um, and is now in California, um, where he is a professor of integrative biology at UC Berkeley. Um, his research program seeks to understand why those global diversity gradients that Diego introduced us to exist and why tropical forests are so amazingly species rich. Um, he studies this problem from a wide variety of angles across some pretty big geographic and taxonomic scales. And he uses approaches that range from community ecology, biogeography, the latest advances in phylogenetics, and population genetics. And I know um, his work primarily uh, from Amazonia. He works in lots of different places. Um, and he's going to be telling us today about why he thinks Proteum, the genus Proteum, which is in the Bursaraceae, is a model system to investigate the importance of biotic interactions in driving the origin and maintenance of tropical rainforest diversity. And um, with that, Paul, while you're getting ready to give your talk, as soon as you're ready to go and share your screen, um, take it away. Thanks, Amelia. And uh, hi, everybody out there um, in Zoom land. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, Lucia Lohman and um, Emilio and Liza and ATBC for setting up this uh, webinar series. I think it's a really great way for us to connect with ATBC members um, and uh, you know many of us are really sad uh, that we couldn't go to a conference this summer and um, but obviously totally understanding um, and this is a good way for us to you know still try to build community and I hope that we can do more of these um, going forward so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, some of the research that I've done over the last 20 years about uh, Proteum uh, a genus in the Bursaraceae and um, as a model system to uh, investigate the importance of biotic interactions. And um, <laughs> there we go. Um, so tropical diversity, uh, Diego mentioned this, um, is something that's, you know, driven my curiosity from the, from the moment I was a student. Um, 
uh, in my first experience in tropical rainforests in Costa Rica. And um, I'm going to focus on trees, but uh, diversity patterns are very similar in, in almost every group of organisms that you can think of. Um, in, the, in the tropics, we have the highest species totals um, towards the equator, and especially in Amazonia, and especially in western Amazonia. Um, the, we don't know exactly how many species we have um, in the Amazon of trees, but um, you know some estimates are 16,000 uh, from the latest paper by Hans Terstegi and his group of the ATDN. Um, and this diversity is, uh, can be partitioned. It can be thought of in a couple of different ways. Um, you can think about how many species are growing in one spot and what we call alpha diversity. And Diego mentioned this, thinking about questions about coexistence and how it is that so many species can share um, one local community. How, how do they interact? Um, how do they compete with one another? Um, and in Western Amazonian forests, in one single hectare, you can get uh, 400 species of trees or more in some places. Um, and you know, in the United States and Canada, we have about, I think, 600 species of trees total in the entire um, that area of North America. So. Um, just to give you a scale of, of the differences in diversity between temperate and tropical forests. Um, but there's also, besides alpha diversity, there's also a really high beta diversity in tropical forests. And beta diversity is how species composition changes from point to point across space. Um, whether you're talking about um, different parts of the Amazon basin or whether you're talking about different habitat types within the Amazon basin, you get very different species compositions, and that's another um, important source of diversity, overall diversity. And this is something that um, Al Gentry, a very famous botanist at the Missouri Botanical Garden, thought was really important. And so today, we're going to think about alpha and beta diversity, and I'm going to think about um, what the role of biotic interactions might be in driving um, uh, th these diversity patterns. And this is a picture actually in Mexico um, of my daughter uh, expressing her admiration for caterpillars that are um, on, on the side of a tree that are going to go up and eat probably every single leaf off this poor tree. Um, and what I, what I wanted to say here on this slide is that um, there have been a lot of hypotheses about why um, natural enemies or, or just biotic interactions are going to be more important in tropical regions. And Diego alluded to some of these, but um, I think the idea is basically very simple. It's just that in tropical areas, you have a higher biomass, a higher species diversity of insects, of pathogens, of mutualistic fungi, of pollinators, of dispersers, and there's less seasonality. And so instead of the temperate zone where you get a, a dormant period in the tropics, you have all of these interactions that are happening all the time. And so evolution is always happening. Um, it never gets a break. Um, and that this kind of natural selection and reciprocal selection can influence um, diversification rates. And so um, three different hypotheses that I'm going to try to cover today um, um, is stuff that I've been working on about why biotic interactions should influence diversification. Um, uh, one of them, and the first one I'm going to talk about is habitat specialization and the idea that plants can become specialized to one set of environments, one kind of habitat, um, and that this could be promoted by biotic interactions. And I'll tell, give you an example from my work uh, in Peru on this. Um, and the second one is this idea of competition for enemy free space, that um, specialized enemies might promote coexistence by reducing the density of um, especially seedlings under a mother tree, like kind of the Jansen Connell effect. And that um, if, if <clears throat> plants come up with a strategy for how to um, defend themselves against different specialized enemies, then they could be competing for this kind of what we call enemy-free space by having a different strategy, a different chemical defenses, let's say, that allows um, very similar, otherwise very similar plants to be not competing um, in, in a very small area. And this might increase the number of species that can survive in, a, in, a, in, one, in, a, in an alpha diversity sense um, and reduce the probability of extinction over time. Um, and third, there's a hypothesis about the geographic mosaic of coevolution, where um, you get different interacting partners of, say, plants and their enemies in different places across a species, a plant species range, and those different interactions are going to drive selection in different trajectories um, and be the impetus for causing divergent um, 
selection and lineage splitting and, and speciation. So to, to answer these questions, I'm going to talk about research on the genus Proteum. And Proteum is, um, uh, is a great model system for studying diversity because it has very high diversity, very high alpha diversity, and very high beta diversity. Um, and it's a tropical genus. It's most, by, by and large, most of the species are found in South America. There's also species in, in Central America and the Caribbean, um, and very few in, um, one, say, one in Madagascar, one in Indonesia, one in um, mainland Asia, one in the Philippines. But most of the species are neotropical, and of those, most of them are found in the Amazon. Of the approximately 200 species or so in the genus, um, over 100, probably more like 150 of them are um, in the Amazon or in the Andes, uh, kind of uh, a little bit above the Amazon basin. And they can be found, uh, you know, 40 or 50 species can be found in one, you know, just a few hectares of forest sharing the same habitat space. Um, and there's also a lot of habitat specialists. So you have proteums that are only found in white sand forests, protium that are only found in clay forests, protium that are only found in seasonally flooded forests, protium that are only found at high elevations. So there's a, um, a, a good potential for, for studying these different diversity patterns. They're also very common and easy to recognize in the forest. Um, they have a great taxonomic base, which I'll tell you about, a work that D Doug Daly has been doing for over uh, I guess for 40 years or so um, at the New York Botanical Garden to understand and how to describe these species. And they have a great, um, um, you know, chemical uh, biology. They produce very interesting terpenes. Um, this is a picture on the right of um, a, a resin ball of, um, that a beetle has drilled into the, into the trunk of this tree. And um, these terpene resins have come out and the beetle is actually living inside of this um, ball of resin. Um, they also produce a lot of different phenolics, tannins, um, and other interesting compounds. And there's lots of things that, that um, eat proteum. There's beetles and caterpillars and, and hemipterans and lots and lots of fungal pathogens, um, most of which we don't know uh, anything about. So over the last 20 years, um, I've been studying um, this group with Doug Daly, and we've been trying to collect as many species as we can and uh, look at their... Um, look at their molecules and make a phylogeny. And we've learned a lot about um, just how they're related to each other this way. Um, we've incorporated fossils into this. We know that they're at least, this group is at least 50 million years old. Um, it came to the Neotropics um, sometime in the, in the Oligocene and then really radiated in the Amazon. Um, all of the species in South America and Central America and the Caribbean are all a monophyletic group. The, the African and Asian ones are a different clade. Um, and we know that, um, you know, th these guys have been diversifying um, over the last, especially over the last 10 million years um, in the Andes and um, Amazon area. So that's been a really important part of their, their radiation. Okay, so starting with um, habitat specialization, um, how might biotic interactions influence habitat specialization? And this is something that I worked on um, during my PhD thesis um, based in Iquitos, Peru. Um, with um, a bunch of really cool people at the Universidad Nacional de Amazonia Peruana and um, El IAP, the Instituto de Investigaciones de la Amazonia Peruana in Iquitos. And um, what I ended up doing was setting up um, a reciprocal transplant experiment. What I wanted to understand was how plants could live in a low resource habitat, which is a white sand forest in, in around Iquitos, and a clay forest, a high resource habitat. And what were the strategies that might influence which plants were growing in which habitat. And that what I was hypothesizing was that there would be a trade-off between defense uh, investment and growth rate. You can only put energy into one or the other. You can't grow fast and have a really highly defended leaf. And that the impact of herbivory would be much higher on a low resource habitat because it'd be mu that much more difficult for a plant to replace the tissues that it's lost to herbivores. And so that would in turn um, slow down the growth rate. And so you would probably not find uh, plants being able to live on both of these habitats. And the way I tested this was to take um, a bunch of species and um, uh, I'm just going to skip this one here. This is just showing a little bit about the um, uh, different kinds of habitats in the Amazon basin and, and the different geologies. But um, here's a picture from Brazil showing some white sand forests surrounded by other types of forests. And, 
And these, these differences in resource availability can be really stark and they can be, um, they can happen really abruptly on the landscape in the Amazon and, and over the scale of just a few meters. Um, and so what I did was I planted these um, uh, clay soil specialists and white sand specialists into each other's habitat in a reciprocal transplant experiment in both habitats. And then I protected half of the plants from insect herbivores. And here's a, um, an orthopteran trying to get into um, a, a reciprocal transplant cage and is being very unsuccessful. And what happened was the clay soil plants did really good when they were growing in white sand forests, but only when they were protected against herbivores. When they were allowed to be, uh, when there were no netting, the herbivores ate um, the clay soil specialists. And this was support for this idea that um, there is a trade-off between growth and defense, and that without herbivores, um, clay soil specialists might be able to live in these nutrient-poor habitats and outcompete um, the white sand specialists. But because herbivores were in the system, they were enforcing this beta diversity. They were enforcing this specialization of white sand specialists in being dominant in white sand forests and clay soil specialists being dominant in clay soils. So um, the next question that I had about this was just, well, um, how important is this in driving beta, I mean, in, in the diversity of the group? So if you think about protium in there, let's say there are, you know, five species of white sand specialists in, in Peru. Um, are they all each other's closest relatives, or did it evolve again and again? And is that something that's happening? Is that this divergent speciation happening again and again, creating more and more diversity in the group? And so, you know, over time we've been accumulating this phylogeny, and I'm not going to explain all this, but all these colors, they correspond to different um, geographic regions and different habitats within the Amazon. <clears throat> and if you're interested, this is a paper from 2014 in evolution. But you can see that um, white sand specialists are um, in red here on the right side of this graph, and they've they've evolved multiple times in the group. And so, you know, they, it, it is it is an important factor in understanding um, diversity in this group is this habitat specialization that's happening again and again to different habitats. Um, a, other another student of mine, Tracy, my sandwich, has kind of followed up on some of these and and looked at. Maybe what are the mechanisms to understand habitat specialization? And this is a species complex called Proteum subserratum that has, it was all called Proteum subserratum, but there were kind of different ecotypes that were known. And we went and set up an experiment where we um, caught every insect that we could find eating these, these plants, and then we looked at the chemicals, and we, we found um, different insects and different chemicals um, associated with the different soil types. And this corresponded with um, the genetics um, as well, and that's something that is consistent with this idea that um, speciation could be happening across um, habitat gradients. Okay, so what about this idea of competition for enemy free space? Now, I, I told you that um, white sand specialization um, evolved multiple times, but if you looked at that phylogeny, you'd see that a lot of the plants are actually each other's closest relatives, but they're all in kind of terra firme clay soil rainforest. So clearly um, that beta diversity isn't the only thing that's, that's causing a really high species richness in this group. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, um, but uh, this work that I did with Diego Salazar um, has really been a lot of fun and it's something that we're going to be continuing to work on for many more years. But basically what we did was take a lot of these um, sympatric species of proteum that are living in Iquitos and try to understand all the different chemicals that each of the species um, is producing. And then uh, survey them for weeks and weeks over a year and try to catch every single insect that we could find um, eating them. And tr to try to understand you know, how much of the, which insects were eating which plants and how did that correspond to the chemicals that the plants were producing. And there are so many interesting things that we've learned about this and I'm just gonna to boil it down to a couple things. But one is, is that close relatives generally don't produce very similar chemicals to each other. So that's an interesting thing that, that we found, and it matches um, other research that's been found in Inga and um, Piper and, and uh, Psychotria, so other unrelated tropical plants. Um, and the other thing is just uh, there's a high diversity of chemicals. Plants devote a lot of their energy to chemicals, sometimes up to 40% of their dry weight. Um, but I, I want you to take away from this graph is just that 
there's a lot of different patterns. Each species has its own subset of these phenolics and saponins and triterpenes and monoterpenes, and that close relatives are generally not similar to each other. When we took the chemical data that we knew from each of these species and we asked um, about, we looked at the landscape of all the different plots where we'd surveyed protium species, and this is, um, I think, 20 different plots across um, Loreto in, in north, northern Peru. We asked, did co-occurring species have more similar uh, or more different uh, chemical uh, profiles than what you'd expect from random draw? We found a very interesting pattern. We found that when you looked at the functional traits, uh, like the way the wood and the leaves and the SLA and all those things that um, you, know, you measure when you, when you measure plant leaves and wood, they're very similar to each other within a plot. And that makes, makes sense, right, across um, you know, nutrient poor and nutrient rich and flooded forests and non-flooded forests. You might expect the plants to have very similar functional traits. But when we looked at the chemistry, the chemistry was way more different than what you'd expect from random. And this is very consistent with this hypothesis that plants are competing for enemy free space. And, um, and so this is something that we want to definitely follow up um, on in the future. Um, the third thing is this question about the geographic mosaic of coevolution. This is something else that that's, I find very interesting. The idea that different assemblages, um, different, different groups of uh, plants in different parts of their range could be interacting with different enemies, and that could be driving um, selection and causing speciation. And so here we set up um, a, a project where we, we monitored um, insects and chemistry in Manaus in just the same way that we did in Iquitos. And we did this for 12 species that were found in both places. And um, although it just looks like they're a couple inches away on this drawing, it's actually 1,500 kilometers. So it's really far away from, from one another. Um, both of them are very close to the Amazon River, though. And the predictions were that we would find completely different herbivores, and we would find different chemical defenses, and that these chemical differences would correspond to insect herbivore differences. And that would be support for this idea of the geographic mosaic hypothesis. Um, and we, we did, had more time, and, um, and the, the, dollar, the research dollar from our grant went further in Iquitos. So we were able to do um, a lot more sampling in Iquitos than we were in Manaus. But um, we still got a lot of data in both places. Um, we were sampling 14 species in Manaus. 12 of those species are the same species um, that live in Iquitos. We found, you know, about 1,000 insect feeding records, uh, 4,214 in Iquitos. Um, lots of different kinds of insects. Most of them are hemipterans, beetles, and lepidoptera. And uh, here's a phylogeny of all the insects that we collected. Um, you can see most of them are hemiptera, but also lepidoptera and coleoptera. And um, the, the similarity is actually the, the species in Manaus and the species in Iquitos have, are really completely different communities of insects. Although they are both Lepidoptera and Coleoptera and, and uh, Hemipterans mostly, they're completely different subsets of those, of those groups. So the insects were about 100% different in Iquitos and Manaus. But when we looked at the chemistry, we felt that the chemistry is almost exactly the same for the species in Iquitos and the species in Manaus. And here's an example from a species called Proteum ferruginium. Just looking at the, um, the chromatogram from, um, I believe this is uh, HPLC, but um, they're almost, almost identical. There's a couple little minor differences, but almost completely identical. Um, so, but the, this is one of my favorite graphs that I you don't really have time to talk about, but even though the, the insects were 100% different in Iquitos and Manaus, the, the species of plants that had the fewest insects attacking them in Iquitos also had the fewest insects attacking them in Manaus. And the ones that had the most insects eating them in Iquitos also had the most insects eating them in Manaus. And we think that that's because um, it's really driven by the chemical diversity that those plants have. The ones that are, have really high chemical diversity can defend themselves against insects in both locations. So we found very big differences in insect communities between Iquitos and Manaus. This was consistent with what we were predicting with the geographic mosaic. But then we found really no difference in chemical defenses, um, which was not what we were predicting at all. And so, you know, it's, it's possible that these small differences that we found are actually the ones that are most important driving evolution, but we don't know yet. We're going to need to do 
further research. And luckily, we will be doing some further research in these locations. Um, we just got a grant um, to study below ground stuff. So we're going to look at these same species of protium. We're going to be looking at the chemical defenses in the roots. We're going to be sequencing a lot of the fungal pathogens that are um, associated with proteum. And we'll also be doing a manipulative experiment to look at below and above ground um, insects and pathogens um, and uh, chemical diversity. And we'll be doing a lot of this work across different scales in Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. And um, I think I just, I hope I have a couple, couple minutes left. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that this work, the, the, all the interesting things that come out of um, the questions that we ask, it comes from being in the field and getting to know these plants and these insects as well as we do, and sharing this information with and learning from a whole, whole large group of people. Um, these are pictures from uh, Peru and Brazil and French Guiana and uh, even Suriname after uh, an ATBC meeting there. Um, a lot of work done with a lot of, a lot of friends and a lot of people. Um, and then, um, you know, having the taxonomic base to be able to understand, you know, it, it's great to collect the plants and to and get to know them in the field, but you need to put all that work together and you need to use specimens and you need to use herbaria. And so this man on the right is uh, Douglas Daly and the man on the left is Ricardo Pergis. Um, on the right is the what we call the taxonomic expert of Bursaraceae and, and Proteum. On the left is the next, the next one coming along. Ricardo's from Brazil. He's an absolute uh, genius in the field and in the herbarium. And being able to take all the specimens and come up with a taxonomic hypothesis is vital to understanding um, diversity. And, um, and then getting into the field and finding new species. This is uh, Ricardo Callejas in Colombia with his old friend Douglas Daly finding a new species of proteum. Look how happy these people are. Um, but I just want to encourage all of you that the, the natural history and the collections in the field are what drive um, the, the, the questions. Um, and it's so important to get that information. Um, it's so important to be uh, in the field and getting an intimate knowledge of your study system. Um, and, you know, I want to share um, all of these findings and, and all of, the, all of the, the interesting questions and conversations and, and, and work that we've done has been in collaboration with um, so many students and friends um, from Brazil, Peru, uh, Colombia. Um, this is a picture from a field course that we did in, um, uh, in Manaus. Uh, a few years ago. We'll be doing more of these uh, field courses with our, our new project. And um, anyway, that's pretty much what I had to say. I want to thank everybody for coming, and I'm looking forward to having a discussion after Karina's talk. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was a great talk. For those of you that are coming in late, just a reminder that all of those burning questions that you have, you can type them in now into the Q&A box, and we will look at all of those questions after our third and final talk. Um, and I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Karina Boehi. She is from Mexico City and a graduate of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, or UNAM, in Mexico City, where she did an undergraduate thesis on phenotypic plasticity in seedling growth and defense under the mentorship of Dr. Rodolfo Dierzo. She then earned a PhD with Bob Marquis at University of Missouri in St. Louis with a thesis investigating the influence of plant ontogeny on bottom-up and top-down forces affecting herbivores. After a postdoc at Stanford, she started a faculty position back at UNAM, where she rose through the ranks to become a full professor in the Department of Evolutionary Ecology. And today, she'll be reminding us that the tropics are more than lowland, moist, and wet rainforests. Her seminar is entitled Ecological and Evolutionary Dynamics of Plant-Caterpillar Interaction Networks in a Tropical Dry Forest. So Karina, take it away. Okay, thanks a lot, Liza and Emilio and Lucia for inviting me to this seminar. I'm thrilled to be among all these friends uh, sharing our stories, fascinating stories, I would say. So let me share my screen. Do you see it? Yeah. And as Liza said, uh, I will be talking to the, about a long-term project uh, in a tropical dry forest 
and talk about the patterns we've found so far and some likely mechanisms we propose for those patterns. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that being a long-term project, many, many different people have been involved in this. And first of all, my very best friend, Ek Del Val, who's the co-PI of this, this project, different colleagues from different universities, different graduate students and field assistants and many volunteers that have participated in this project over and over every year for the last 13 years. So this is a teamwork. Uh, so seasonal triforce, why they're important? First of all, they're of the family of uh, tropical dry forests are uh, from the family of seasonal and dry forest. Uh, we have Cerrado, Caatinga, Savannas. The tropical dry forests are important in Mexico because 38% of them occur in um, Mexico, but sadly only 27% remain as primary forest because we have an annual deforestation rate of 3%. And that has led us with a mosaic of agricultural and cattle pastures with secondary forest recovering and primary forest in what was originally the original range of these important ecosystems. Um, and why they are important? Mexican tropical dry forests are particularly species rich and not necessarily explained by this very nice relationship Al Gentry proposed many years ago where you can predict plant uh, species diversity from the rainfall uh, amount. So we are a positive outlier with more uh, plant species diversity than expected by this uh, relationship and with a great degree of endemisms. We know very little, however, or before this project, we knew very little uh, about Mexican tropical dry forest herbivores, but we knew that they caused between nine and 13% of leaf damage to tropical dry forest plants and that the main herbivores are Lepidopterans. And these groups are of particular ecosystemic importance because these caterpillars then become pollinators of many plant species, so they are essential for tropical trees uh, reproduction. They also, as um, Paul Pine just described, they exert an important top-down control on plants, promoting plant diversity, and they also participate importantly in nutrient cycling. So the first question we ask along these many years is how, uh, given that we have this mosaic of uh, agriculture and pasture lands that then are abandoned and they start to recover towards uh, primary forests, we ask how forest succession affects land com uh, herbivore communities and their interactions with plants, expecting that these communities should change with the changes occurring along forest succession. To answer these questions, we worked in the Chamela Huixmala Biosphere Reserve, which is located in the Pacific coast of Mexico in the state of Jalisco. And there we established 12 permanent plots within four successional stages. So we have initial stages, which were uh, recently abandoned pastures between three to five years of abandonment, early successional stages between five and years of abandonment, intermediate successional stages with between eight and 12 years of, aband of abandonment. And then last, the non-disturbed major forest within the biosphere reserve. So in these 12 plots, every year we sample plants and herbivores in permanent transects once a month for the, during the rainy season for these 11 years of study. What we found in terms of vegetation, we found about 1,300 individual trees from about 140 species in 36 families. And these were only trees um, above 50 centimeters in height, excluding lianas and uh, herbs. The most common family were Leguminosi and Eucurbisi, and there are the rest of the families. With respect with Lepidopteran herbivores, we found more than 13,000 uh, caterpillars from around 540 species. Half of them were identified uh, molecularly with barcoding or morphologically with um, our taxonomists. And they belong to 36 families, being Erebidae, Saturnidae, and Asperidae, the most common uh, caterpillar families. However, Interestingly, only 32 species had more than 25 individuals. So most of these species were single or double tones, and only 32 species out of the 500 had 
an abundance greater than 25 individuals. And I'll come to this point later during the talk. As for succession, what we found is that species composition change along these successional gradients and major forests had distinctive uh, plant communities and initial, uh, the, the initial stages as well. And um, caterpillar, caterpillar communities were also distinctive in these initial stages and early stages, whereas intermediate and major sta uh, for successional stages shared uh, the same caterpillar communities. Richness and diversity also was aff were affected by um, forest succession. We found that intermediate stages had lower species richness, but uh, in terms of, of diversity, initial uh, successional stages and the major stage were the ones with greater uh, diversity in both Shannon, considering Shannon and Simpson diversity species. Uh, okay. When we analyzed the caterpillar plant interaction networks, we saw that some parameters remain constant across succession. So nestedness, modularity, and specialization remain constant regardless of the successional stage. But the other parameters increase during succession. So network size increased, connectance, compartmentalization, and robustness. So our first home take home message for this part would be that forest succession actually affects cat caterpillar communities. <clears throat> and that although interaction networks parameters are quickly recovered, species composition and richness take more than 20 years to be comparable with non-disturbed areas. So coming back to these very abundant species, we know, we all here know that in general, tropical herbivores have been reported to be extremely specialist as uh, Paul Pan just described. However, it happened to be that these most common species of caterpillars in Chamela were quite generalist. This is a graph of these species and the colored bars are not the number of species they ate, they are the number of families they were feeding on. So for example, this very, very abundant orgia species ate up to 64 uh, plant species from this much uh, family. So we are talking about very generalist herbivores. And we saw in this an opportunity to study uh, the ecological plasticity or flexibility in herbivores' diet breadth. What determines that they eat some species and not others? And the first approach to do this is uh, the opportunity we had to evaluate how extreme events, in particular hurricanes, affected caterpillar plant interaction networks. Because when you do these long-term projects, you run to these unexpected events such as hurricanes, and then there's, there's the opportunity to study them. So I put this picture here, here, and I hope you can see all the white sticks. Those are broken trees, like just a broken pencil after a huge hurricane passed by during the, uh, our study. So before describing this, we had two hurricanes, Hurricane Jova, a category two, a category two hurricane, uh, very wet, so with more than 500 millimeters in a single event. And then we had Hurricane Patricia, that was rather a very windy hurricane, a category five hurricane, that it's a hurricane, the greatest hurricane recorded in the Pacific coast of Mexico, and I think the whole continent. And so these both two hurricanes are damaging, are causing damage to many trees and hence affecting the availability of uh, host plants for herbivores. So what we did was to analyze the network parameters, the interaction network parameters before the hurricanes, which are these green boxes, and after the hurricanes. And we saw that uh, some parameters, such as network size, number of compartments, number uh, network specialization, decreased after these hurricanes. So herbivores were becoming more uh, less specialists after these events. And accordingly, other parameters increase, such as the number of links, the robustness, and the connectivity of these networks being less um, specialized than the connectivity increased. And that had to do probably with uh, something that we call the diet breadth, which is the ratio between the number of species eaten by a particular herbivore relative to the number of available plant species. And when we calculated these indexes for these species before and after the hurricanes, 
we saw that they actually increased their diet threat. So probably what happened was that the hurricanes de decreased the availability and quality of host plants because the herbivores needed to eat what was left. So not their preferred foods, but they had the ability to feed on other things. Then, so that's clim extreme climatic events, but this area also has a very um, variable climate. One can say that the mean annual variation precipitation is about 800 millimeters a year, but the range of variation, we can have very dry years, as dry as 400 millimeters of precipitation, or very wet year, as, as wet as 1400 millimeters. So climatic variation, it's it's quite uh, large in this area. So we took this an, as an opportunity to study and to answer the question how climatic variability affects herbivore diet spread in these very common um, herbivores. So we took uh, temperature and precipitation variables across these 11 years and not taking only the average of these variables, but also the coefficient of variation of these variables because we were interested in variation. And we run a PCA and we found that PC1 uh, was determined by temperature variables, so minimum temperature and the coefficient in variation in both maximum and minimum temperature, daily temperatures. And PC2 was uh, described more by precipitation variables, so maximum precipitation events in a single event, the coefficient of variation of precipitation along, along the whole year, and uh, interestingly, the span of the preceding dry season. And I'll come back to this in a sec. So when analyzing this uh, diet breadth for these cat common caterpillars, uh, what was the relationship with these um, climatic variables? We found, for example, that during years with an average of cooler days, but increased variation in the daily temperatures, caterpillars expanded their, their diet breadth. And uh, maybe this is related to the failure of some individuals to survive during very, very hot days. So with, they, they wouldn't be found in some plants, whereas in cooler years, they would be found in more plants. Then uh, regarding precipitation, during years with high precipitation, but greater variability in precipitation, and interestingly preceded by uh, prolonged uh, dry seasons, we found these negative relationships. Uh, we found a smaller diet breadth, and probably this is due to the influence of plant phenology. When the trees are shedding their leaves earlier, and the likelihood of survival in one host and in not in other host, and also uh, influenced by uh, growth defense relationships that would be altered by the availability of water across the rainy season. When analyzing the network size, the network parameters, we saw that both network size and the number of compartments also had a relationship um, with uh, this precipitation variable, increasing in more um, wet years, preceded by longer um, dry seasons. So take home message for this part, hurricanes, and interannual climatic variability can have significant effects on plant caterpillar interaction networks through their influence on caterpillar's diet breadth, likely affected by changes in the availability and quality of host plants. And here we have many uh, research questions for the future to explore. But then thinking on what mechanisms can be driving these patterns, we try to answer a very well-known question, why herbivores eat some plants and not other, others? And here, just Diego and Paul just said, what we also all know that uh, plant defenses is crucial for, um, to answer these questions due to the one-to-one -one evolutionary arms race between plants and herbivores, including plant volatiles. But also another factor which is very important is the capacity of plant recogni recognition to detect those plants that herbivores are actually able to feed on. So we asked, how does the community context influence caterpillar plant communication and recognition in this system? And here, um, I'll just make a stop to remind us that what, what do plants want? They, they want not to be found by their herbivores. So they produce information, odors for other reasons, 
But the important thing is that um, these, these signals could be should be difficult to decode by herbivores, so making the, themselves difficult to locate by herbivores. And here, I want to I, I want you to imagine being a moth or a butterfly trying to find your host plant in this sea of odors in a very diverse forest. So it's not a matter of finding your uh, host species because it's producing one or two volatiles, but you have to distinguish all 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 these volatiles from a sea of odors there's probably out there. On the side of herbivores, uh, what they want is to find their food, of course, to eat. So they have evolved mechanisms to identify suitable food sources for decoding this information. So here's where my colleague Sergei Saavedra from, um, from MIT um, enter, enters into the story because he was interested in incorporating the information theory to our system. And um, it was very interesting because there's concepts and parameters in information theory that were useful to describe what's going on in the system. So there's a concept mutual information that describes the amount of information that one can obtain about the objects knowing the signals. Here, the object being the plant and the signals being the volatiles. So th this would constitute the coding strategies of plants. There's another term called conditional entropy which describes the uncertainty of correctly identifying a, an object, an object in this case, the plant, given that speci a specific sign now, this is a volatiles, have been observed. And these would be the decoding strategies of herbivores. And both coding and decoding strategies can be related to fitness, because imagine that if the uncertainty of um, it, that the uncertainty of the relationship between the object and the signal is very high, then that would be an advantage of the plant being less likely to be find, found. In contrast, the better the mutual information is, the greater fitness an herbivore will have because that would allow him to find, uh, better find their food plants. So what we had was a matrix between which animals, which uh, herbivores were, find, were found in particular plants. So this is our AP matrix. Then our colleague Sue Pengjuan was very interested in solid volatiles. So she went to these plants and collected the volatiles produced by them. And that allowed us to have this plant uh, VOC matrix in which uh, we, we recorded which volatiles were associated with each plant species. And these allowed us to have this AV matrix, animal VOC matrix, which means which herbivores are associated with particular combinations of volatiles. And these associations represent the herbivore decoding strategies. So both plants and herbivores can be modi can modified, can increase their fitness relationships by modifying these different matrices. And here's a brief cartoon of what I, I just said where we have these uh, matrices that can mutate to increase either plants that aim to decrease the decoding efficiency of herbivores by changing this plant volatile matrix and the animal plant AP matrix that can mutate to increase the fitness animals with the aim to increase its efficiency by changing the interactions, the AP interactions. So this allowed us to propose that how um, herbivores and plants could uh, increase their fitness through this animal volatile uh, matrix. So to test if these hypotheses of coding and decoding mechanisms could predict the patterns we observed in the field, we run this um, optimization process evolutionary trajectory and after a couple of uh, generations, we saw that the uncertainty of herbivores actually stabilized in, with low values, whereas the uncertainty for plants stabilized at the uh, high values of uncertainty. And these, when analyzing our field, we're matching this with our field data, we saw that uh, we've got a pretty good match where the herbivores tend to minimize this uncertainty, uncertainty whereas the plants tend to increase this uncertainty. Another way to see it is if we match different the optimization mechanisms being minimum 
or maximum for plants and herbivores, we saw that the perfect match for the observed observed uncertainty and the simulated uncertainty was when herbivores lowered their uncertainty and plants uh, increased their uncertainty. So take a message for this fact part is that information theory can help to predict the patterns we observe in plant herbivore interactions and that volatiles appear to be a significant way of communication or misinformation between plants and their herbivores where plants seem to have the lead for the moment, and that information arms race can drive plants to produce uh, VOCs that are commonly shared by other species to confuse herbivores driving towards herbivore specialization in a few plants. And as concluding remarks, I'll just add that the long-term studies are very useful to better understand the factors influencing the ecology and evolution of plant herbivore interactions and that secondary forests represent great reservoirs of uh, this herbivore diversity that should be um, included into the conservation efforts. And last, that climatic change can alter herbivore interactions through these effects I described on climatic variability on uh, which, which, species, which plant species an herbivore, an herbivore feeds on, not only through uh, individual survival, but this is what I just said, through modifications in plant quality and uh, hence diet threat. Thanking again the whole team that worked in this project and the funding agencies that uh, made this project, these different parts of the project um, possible. Now I'm gonna be happy to take uh, questions from all of you. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Professor Karina. That, that was fantastic. I'm still reeling from the 13,000 caterpillars. So <laughs> let alone the, the information theory, uh, that, that's just remarkable. That's just astounding. Um, we have lots of, lots of questions. Uh, before we get to them, just a reminder to people watching that they can post their questions in the Q&A um, by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom, a box will pop up. Um, in some cases, we've got some similar questions, so we're going to try to combine them to make it a little easier for people to answer. We've got plenty of time for questions, so please do um, bring them forward. Um, and with that, thank you to our, our speakers, and I'm going to throw the first question out to Diego, if that's okay. Ready, Diego? Ready. Okay, great. So the, uh, the questions we had here, um, and Every single one was prefaced by thank you very much for that fantastic talk and for giving us some insights into um, way, different things we can try in, in, with our group. Um, what types of compounds um, is each of the tests that you showed us perhaps best for? Maybe a different way of putting it might be, are there particular groups of species that particular tests might be really good for? You mentioned one of them with the foam test, but what about the others? And, and finally, a related question, are there any that are really good for seed chemistry? Yes, and so, well, with respect to the compounds, the, the 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 drawback is that it, it these techniques can only do big groups of compounds, and so you cannot differentiate between one specific compound. It's just groups of compounds, and so, uh, for example, the uh, the the one with the cell phone and the blue color, which it is a phenolic test, it looks for uh, the, the units the, the units that. Uh, um, Create phenolics. Yes, there's a phenol ring, and so whatever whatever has this phenol ring, it will it will show up. And so um, what you get is is big bulk information. Uh, in terms of which compounds can you do, pretty much everyone. There's 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 a plethora of literature on colorimetric uh, analysis, and you can do stuff for alkaloids, flavonoids, phenolics, ter terpenes, even for monoterpenes. There's all kinds of little uh, simple chemical reactions you can do and get a change in color. Yeah, so, so the idea was to tell, tell people that this information, although it's, it's, it's kind of scattered, it's there, and with a little bit of work, you can make it work with very simple tools. Um, and with respect of seed, again, the, 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 drawback, the other drawback is that the differences in chemistry have to be big. And so it, it doesn't matter what the tissue is. Uh, roots, stems, leaves, seeds, flowers, fruits, it doesn't matter. The chemistry will be the same. 
Yes. What it's important is that the difference uh, between one of your experimental treatments and the other, sh or one of your species and the other, uh, should be different. Uh, uh, different enough so you can see it on a cell phone. Yes. If you don't have a cell phone and you are lucky enough to have a spectrophotometer, then don't worry, you'll catch that difference. Uh, uh, the machine is good enough to find it. But um, for cell phone approaches or the foam approach, um, you need differences that are big enough that the cell phone can catch those differences with a level of certainty. So if you're comparing seeds between species, I'm pretty sure it's going to work. If you're comparing seeds within a species, maybe between one location and the other, uh, there's a high likelihood that those approaches will not work and you'll need a spectrophotometer to, to capture those, those little differences. Great, thank you. No problem. Great. So I'll, I'll ask the second question, which I think is primarily to Paul, but applies to, to all of the talks um, touched on this. Um, one of the participants asks, how do you think plant chemistry is affected by nutrient distribution gradients? As data accumulates across forest sites, it's becoming increasingly clear that nutrient gradients drive plant species diversity and distributions. Is it possibly, is it possible to primarily is it possibly the primary underlying cause of chemical differences, um, these nutrient gradients? And I would piggyback my own personal question on top of that. What is the relative influence, do you think, at these scales of nutrient gradients versus water availability, rainfall gradients, and, and differences in canopy openness and light availability in space and in time? So Paul, <laughs> Paul, do you want to tackle that first and then anyone else can, can chime in? I guess I'll start. Um, that's a big question. And um, um, the ideas that I had, I, I was sharing about the growth defense trade off, um, are about plant strategies in response to um, resource availability and whether that, that could be thought of in terms of um, uh, nutrients and it could be thought of in terms of water. But um, the, the one thing that, that we've learned from plant physiological ecology is that. The way plants respond to um, low resources, whether it's drought or nutrient stress, is they, they respond by having a very conservative growth strategy, by growing very slowly and having um, leaf uh, tissue that is very long-lived. Um, and so the predictions with that kind of go more about the amount of defense that would be invested and rather than what particular kinds of defense. But I think the question is getting at, uh, the question that you asked was, was more nuanced than that. And it was asking maybe, what about the types of compounds? And that's a really interesting question. So if you think about protium, protium has what we call mostly sea-based defenses. So terpenes and phenolics and saponins are mostly, the, those are molecules that are, uh, have a carbon structure. And, and the famous N-based compounds like alkaloids, you basically don't find in protium. Th those are more in uh, Diego's group, Piper. Um, and there are other groups that have a lot of these interesting alkaloids. And then the, the idea being that are there gradients of, um, say, soil resources, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus, that are influencing which plant groups are more common in these different places is a very open question. Um, and I will remind you that some plants are actually able to do end fixing. And so the 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 question that follows from that is there is there any relationship between say n based compounds with uh, plants that are able to fix nitrogen um, and I'm going to turn this down to uh, below me Diego um, see if he wants to jump on that and and keep going absolutely so so this is a super interesting question because we know very little about what we uh, some of us are starting to call the phytochemical landscape and so the phytochemical landscape it's uh, has three major um, axes. One is diversity of chemicals, but the other one has to do with um, other axes that uh, are related to the plant, like for example ontology. So how the plant chemistry changes with the age of the plant. Uh, the other one, and this is something that Karina actually has, was one of the first people that shouted from the mountains and we were dumb enough to not figure it out until now, uh, but it's something very important. But the other one, it's, it's the nutrient. And so you can imagine all these interactions. Like, like Paul said, there's a lot of these things that is genetically uh, controlled. So if, if I move to China, I'm not gonna stop producing testosterone. I might produce less, but I will still be producing testosterone. And so especially when 
we compare across species rather than within species, uh, the, the changes in the composition of the compounds is not likely to go, going to change. It's the concentration of those compounds that is going to change. Um, and yet, uh, I have to say that, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, one of my students did this excellent project on tomato, which is not the most exciting thing for this kind of talk, but uh, she controlled both ontology and uh, nutrient availability of the chemistry of the tomato. And we found out that we actually were surprised that although out of hundreds of compounds, there were a few compounds that were only present, only expressed on the tomato plant in certain life stage at certain nutritional levels. Yes, in the other uh, uh, times, these compounds were completely absent, and that was a huge surprise for us. I'm writing the papers right now because it's 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 very interesting to see uh, how these compounds pop up out of nowhere. Yeah? And so, um, uh, this uh, so it, there seems to be something important here. But despite of that, this is a few exceptions out of the hundreds of compounds plants produce. And so, um, there is something important. It's something that. Uh, actually a lot of us are really interested to start incorporating both nutrition uh, and phenology and ontology uh, to understand the interactions and the chemistry that modulates these interactions. I don't know if Katina wants to say something about that. I'll just add up that uh, what we found 11 years, like the climatic variation, one, one can have like a snapshot of a picture of what's going on, but then when you go on do the same thing over and over and over, you see that things are much complicated. So when you, when you find something one year, herbivores are, are more flexible than one we think. That's like my, my overall comment for these questions, that they, they are indeed able, and not all herbivores, in particular those generalist herbivores, have this liability to change their diets regardless of the plant chemistry. I think that's the, the beautiful complexity that Diego is yeah talking about and also the the great frustration of tropical ecology um, so the the next question is for karina would it be more informative to take into account the relative abundance of diet components in relation to the relative abundance of plant availability when you're looking at diet breath so a uh, relative abundance of plants i guess yes so like the, how the availability of plants and then the, the, what the insects are actually consuming and, and comparing those two as a measure of diet breath. Yeah, that's a great idea and thanks for the comment because I just analyzed this data like a month ago. So this is like a preliminary run set, but that's a great suggestion to now incorporate the abundance of these, um, of these host plants. To, to see if that affected also a reverse plan choice. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Robert. Okay, um, the next question here um, comes from uh, our friend Kyle. And um, it's for especially Paul and Diego, but really for everybody. And uh, as is typical of um, Kyle's questions, it's um, really insightful. And so listen carefully, because I think there's, you know, it might be easy um, to kind of lose track of it if you start thinking about the first part before we get to the end. So the question is, what's the resolution of the apparent paradox of relatively different chemistry between sister species, but relatively um, similar chemistry between physically distant conspecific populations? In other words, do you maybe suspect or have you observed an immediate ramp up of chemical trait divergence in the cladogenic moment, or maybe when the gene pool trajectories have reached some kind of critical level of independence. Um, and um, you notice the paradox. So if you thought you were going to slide that by Kyle, you were wrong. So um, why don't why don't you start there, Paul, and then Diego? And I think you know if, uh, Karina probably has some comments to follow up on that as well. So take it away. Oh boy. Um... Where to even begin to try to give any weak, weak answer to this question? Well, first of all, um, we took a stab in, in uh, when I say we, I mean Diego, because uh, he's the one uh, who has the big brain about this. We tried to, Diego figured out a way to try to take the whole chemicals that we had for each plant and figure out which were the ones that were associated with which herbivores and were having a, uh, an effect. And the, the method that he used was 
really relying on the fact that we found so many generalists in the system. And so that meant that the chemicals that we were studying, they had like a shared currency so that the same chemicals were interacting with a bunch of different plants and a bunch of different herbivores. And we could, we could sum up against all the herbivore species which, ones were, which chemicals had a positive and a negative effect on the plants. So that's taking a step. But that, that, that gives us a, a hypothesis about how the chemicals might be interacting with which herbivores. But you really would need to go and um, do an actual experiment where you would offer, perhaps, you would maybe synthesize those compounds and do feeding trials with, with the herbivores and, and see whether or not they, did, they had the effect that you thought. Um, but but what the, the pattern that I reported is a very crude, uh, just sort of attempt at, at trying to understand how all that diversity is partitioned in it. It probably involves all the different inter interacting partners, all the above ground and below ground um, enemies that are, in, you know, around those those protium species that are coexisting, and then being able to boil that down and then go back to the phylogeny. Well, I'm going to pass that off to Diego because Diego, I know, has done some experiments um, with all our data and the phylogeny to see how we could actually model chemical evolution on the phylogeny and whether we could come up with some sort of hypothesis framing te um, framework. So uh, that was a just a piss poor attempt at, at answering that question. But I'm going <laughs> to. Well, that was just terrible. That was just terrible. Diego, would you please bail out, Professor Fine? I'm going to try. I've been passing out a white hot potato, but let's see how it goes. So, uh, Kyle, I'm going to see if I can do this. Um, so, um, whether there is this explosion of divergence in the time of speciation, yeah? uh, because that will be the only thing that will explain what Kyle is pointing out, um, species very far apart, being very uh, consistent in their chemistry, and yet species very closely phylogenetically related, very chemically different. Well, one thing that I think I, uh, we've seen all in, in all these highly diverse uh, clades in the tropics is the fact that they look like umbrellas. They have these wide wide crown groups with very deep basal nodes where the species kind of explode in those most of the time in the last two million years. Uh, we see this in, in Piper, Proteum, Inga, uh, Psychotria. You see these, these kind of incredible explosion of diversification that is recent. And with that diversification, we see a pattern again on all these groups, which is that uh, these species tend to be phylogenetically clustered in terms of the habitat they choose. They tend to be more similar phylogenetically than expected by chance, and yet chemically divergent more than expected by chance, even in, in, in close neighborhood. It's like there's, there's this uh, pressure that keeps them together which is most likely uh, related to resource acquisition traits, yes? And yet at the same time, these other things kind of explode in, in the top, which is these the, the defense traits. And uh, the way I see it is a little bit like Piper. Let me see if I can explain it really fast. Piper, it's amazing because Piper, uh, by, because of the way it dispersed, is dispersed through um, uh, bats and bats eat a bunch of pipers every night and when they poop, they poop all the pipers together. Pipers tend to live in, in these patches. There are multiple species patches. And so you find a patch of piper and you find five, seven, eight species of piper. I found patches that are one meter by one meter with 20 species of piper all living together. The amazing thing is that these uh, share the same microhabitat. They like to live in the same places with the same kind of soil. But on top of that, they share the same herbivores and the, sa the, sa the same pollinators and the same dispersers. So from their point of view, in terms of resource acquisition and um, so positive species interactions, they act as a monoculture. Yes? They act as, as a single species. In the other hand, uh, for the negative species interactions, yes, they act as a different species. And so that brings them uh, a good thing of living together or having this phylogenetic clustering, yes, and a good thing about being different species and have a different chemistry because from the point of view of the pollinator, they're the same, and from the point of view of the herbivore, they're different, yes? And so this creates these beautiful, completely divergent selections, yes? In which you could see something like that, that once you become a different species, then you have this uh, high, high advantage of being as chemically different as possible 
as you can. And from papers that uh, have been published also recently, it's super interesting to see how uh, liable chemical defenses are because it just takes a few uh, little changes in their, in their DNA to change an enzyme to completely change a compound. And that's why we see, for example, um, caffeine being expressed in groups so different uh, from tea to, to coffee to oranges, yes, and uh, um, still be the same caffeine, but coming from completely different genetic pathways. And so I, I think that chemistry is, is, is that liable that it requires very few genetic mutations to change, yes, and uh, once you become a different species, you have a high advantage in these highly diverse, highly packed, sympatric communities to become as chemically different as you can, yes? While you're a single species, gene flow, yes, will make sure that you keep consistent uh, uh, chemistry, I, I, I think, I believe. Again, 100% uh, 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 out of my head, no data to show it. Let's write a grant, let's, let's, let's go for this one too, why not? I buy it, sounds good. <laughs> I don't know if you convinced Kyle, but I'm sure he'll let you know if you didn't. Um, so for our next question, um, which is really to everyone, um, all of our panelists, if you've thought about this, is um, if plant metal accumulation, things like aluminum, is a defense mechanism, and whether this could play a role in the chemical defenses that, that you've been discussing or in, in plant herbivore interactions in, in tropical forests. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know if there are like metal accumulations in like, the plants I study. So I, I think I don't have the answer for that one. Uh, I don't know either. I will say that um, on the white sand forest, it's just quartz sand. Everything just flows through. There's no metal in uh, white sand forests. That's just a punt. Again, I have no idea. It sounds very interesting. And, and we do know there's a couple of studies that have shown that um, metal accumulation in detoxification uh, uh, by plants, not in the tropics, but in temperate regions, have uh, created um, ecological evolution, uh, evolution in, in, in sympathy, uh, ecological speciation. Yeah? And so uh, there might be something behind that. It's the only kind of thing that pops up into my head when I think about um, metal accumulation in plants. But it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, if, if the plants can survive it and accumulate it, it will be interesting to see what, what, what does it do to herbivores. But you know, maybe it's bad for the dispersers. Maybe you put it in the fruits. I, I, I have no idea. Excellent. There should be a prize for uh, whoever asks a question that stumps all the panelists. That's just great. Um, the next question here is um, for Dr. Karina. And Flavia says she's amazed that the caterpillars increase their dye breaths after an intense climatic event. And the question here is, are, are these caterpillars originally generalists that preferred a single or, or a few host species? Um, and any idea if the caterpillars are changing to closely related species of plants or chemically similar plants when they make the switch? Yeah, I was amazed as well. And um, as I just mentioned, it was these, these general species are very generalist. So that's why I showed the bars with the coloring with so many families that I, I actually believe that they are hyper generalists. So I haven't, I, I, we haven't analyzed these where they switch, to which hosts they, they switch. And that's a great suggestion to do, to go further into that analysis to, to see if they ate what was left or they actually switched. But the fact is that these, um, they are very generalist, but um, I, didn't know, I don't know if I mentioned it, but they were more, more abundant in some plant species. So probably they have preferred host species, but they have the ability to feed on other species. So for example, this very, very abundant first one I showed, I remember that only in eight species, they had more than eight or 10 individuals, no? So despite the fact that they are able to eat at, and survive from different hosts from land species, they, they have their preferred hosts, but they're still being general, generalists. But, and your second question, I don't know to which plants they switch after these events, and that's a great suggestion to dig into if they just moved a little bit, but I have the feeling that there are like 
they eat everything so <laughs> that's my feeling but i'll go i'll go and dig into that thank you Claudia. Okay, so the the next question is for everyone and anyone who wants to jump in um, and it's about the higher trophic level so what are the role of things like parasitoids or i'd also add you know um predators like uh, on the insect herbivores like birds interacting in these systems and having cascading effects in the patterns and, and are you looking at that and finding anything related to that um all right i'll, I'll start but i know that uh, this is something that karina knows a lot about too and well diego as well but um i would well, well one thing i've always wondered about is that in this growth defense trade-off you know if if you are investing less in defense and more in growth why don't the insects that are eating you why don't they just increase their abundances and eat more because you're less defended and the answer to that question has to be the third trophic level the plants have to they, they know that there's enough uh, birds and bats and um, parasitoids out there that they keep the 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 herbivore load at a, at, a, at a low enough level so that the plants can get away with investing less in defenses. And um, that's something that, you know, I, I've wanted to set up an experiment to test it because the white sand and clay with Karina, yeah, for many years um, that we never were able to get funding to do it. But um, it's also a complicated uh, project, obviously. There, there's a really a cool um, uh, scientist named Sunshine Van Bael uh, at Tulane University, uh, who was able to set up a kind of a neat experimental system doing the, the trophic interactions. And she found, um, you know, it was a little bit of a different question, but she found very strong effects. But um, the thing that makes me, you know, want to hear what Karina has to say is that I know that volatiles, you know, and Karina is showing some really cool new research on the signaling of, of volatiles. And the idea that volatiles uh, is, have, are, are, are attracting especially parasitoids uh, to come in and interact with, um, you know, maybe deter herbivores from attacking plants has been out there for a while, but it would be very interesting to study it on a more um, systematic way. And, and um, so I want to hear what Karina has to say. I uh, just want to add up that in this uh, Chamela system, I, I did a study on the top-down top -down effects of birds on plants and herbivores. And I did find some interesting cascading effects that I didn't talk about today, but yes, birds are ex exerting a, an important top-down uh, effect on, on these plants. And of course that uh, changes along plant ontogeny because that was my dissertation on like how these top-down forces changes as, as trees grow from uh, seedlings, saplings and to reproductive trees. And I'm gonna blame, blame our kids, Paul, because that project to test that, those ideas in your sand white uh, forests, um, we were reproducing at that time. So we had to stop our plants to go to the Amazonia to raise our um, of, uh, offspring. And then maybe we can just go back and set up finally that project to answer the question, how these top-down forces are different in white sand forests because it's quite interesting too. We can get the kids to set up the experiment. Yeah, they can be our field assistants. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Before I ask this next question, I was going to say that there are other, you know, um, predatory insects too, right? That that are responding to volatiles. So, um, you know, there's there's plenty of work, including some of our own, showing that. Uh, mutualistic ants will respond as soon as you put some leaf tissue extract on there. It's almost certainly to volatiles and they'll run out and do it too. So um, there's definitely, I think, lots of opportunities to look into the specifics of that because there's been very little done, you know, on the particular responses. Um, we have a question here again for all panelists. And so um, since um, Dr. Karina finished up the response to the last one, we'll give her a chance to um, take a break and we'll start again. Maybe I'll put this one to, we'll do it in the same order. Let's go to um, Dr. Diego first and then over to Paul. And so the question is, um, chemical defenses are um, really well studied in the vegetative parts of plant systems. And what's your take on how these differences among species will translate into promoting reproductive isolation? And while it's not it's not quite the same thing. I'm going to follow up with another question that came in immediately afterwards, just to make sure that we get it in there, which is um, that, you know, what do we know about how 
um, this these compounds that you're looking into might make their way into reproductive parts of flowers or developing seeds or things like that. Yeah. So indeed, there's 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 much less knowledge on on how these compounds affect reproduction. It's something that um, it's it's starting to pick up speed, uh, but we don't know. It's it's uh, uh, from the times of Ehrlich and Raven when they proposed the idea of coevolution and the arms race. They proposed that uh, chemical compounds were there uh, were, were a major player in the ability of of species groups to speciate and and to and to diversify. And however, they, they didn't put any single mechanism on how that works. Um, they they talk about how the traits diverge, but now how the actual the act of speciation, which will, should come at least at some point with a, the, a break on the gene flow, uh, will happen. And so uh, um, there's there's these ideas that uh, there might be some coordination of chemistry involved in this. At the end of the day, chemistry uh, uh, plays important roles in pollen recognition, plays important roles in attracting of pollinators, attracting of dispersers, um, it plays important roles in the defense of seeds in germination against pathogens. And so there, there must be uh, uh, strong links, but it, to this day, there's not a lot we know about. Uh, I, I know Karina has worked in this a little bit. I don't know if you want to pick up that ball <laughs> from there. I haven't. <laughs> no, but I think I'm pretty sure that there must be a, a significant effect on chem chemistry in reproductive parts, either flowers or seeds in species divergence. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have the experience, but I'm pretty sure it's going on there. I'm sorry, like a cocktail of chemi chemicals. So they are influencing from many, many parts um, these things, yeah. So uh, I'll just say that um, this idea that, that like you could adapt to, uh, that your chemicals would adapt to defending against local enemies um, and then maybe with a geographic mosaic or you're in a different habitat type, um, imagine that you could still have gene flow between um, these di these divergent, say, ecotypes. The hypothesis was from John Endler is that you would, could have intermediate phenotypes between the two habitat specialists, but they would have maladapted uh, chemicals, right? So the the chemics chem the mix of chemicals that those intermediates would have would not be optimal for either the you know, herbivore community on habitat one or habitat two or geographic location one or geographic location two. And we really wanted to test that with the project um, on Proteum Subserratum. But um, we did find some, some uh, trees in the field um, that had, um, it looked like they were definitely hybrids between the two. Um, but um, we didn't find any, uh, we thought we would get seedlings. We, would, we did a genotyping experiment of all the seeds, seedlings that we found, and we found zero. So we think that most of the reproductive isolation has already happened between, um, between these ecotypes, um, but it's something I really want to test. Um, and you know, one other question, uh, just to follow up on, on, on studying flowers, at least for proteum, the flowers are like less than a millimeter in size. And um, they're very, they don't last very long either. And um, John Lokovum, who we need to mention his name because he's the guy who developed so many of the protocols for studying um, plant chemistry, chemical diversity, and, and, and the gravimetric approaches that Diego um, talked about. Um, you know, John was always, a sli he was always like, you got to bring me more material. You can't just, just bring me like a leaf. I need, I need like, you know, 100 grams. And so, the idea of like getting a hundred grams of uh, um, of proteum flowers just seems like you know it would be almost impossible. But um, I think there are ways now that that Diego knows that we could do things on on smaller amounts of tissue and we could get good results. And so, to, just to think about really quick on that, uh, there's a lot of stuff we don't know, especially on volatiles. I mean, uh, there's there's interesting questions like, for example, why there's so much volatiles in the roots. Think about that. Why do we have so many? volatile compounds in the roots. And these compounds, for, there's this amazing paper written about safferol from the 1983 and 1984, uh, which shows all these different plants and all these different um, 
parts of the plants that contain saffron, a very volatile compound. And so saffron is used by a lot of flowers to, to, uh, as the scent to attract, but it gives a lot of flavor to certain fruits. It protects some seeds, it's found in roots, it's found on stems, it's found on leaves. And so there's, I, I think, uh, the logic uh, will stand when, when you think about uh, that if a plant can produce a compound that can serve multiple functions, uh, reproduction and defense and, and, and maybe other ones, uh, that compound can be uh, very, very good for fitness because it will be really cheap to produce it in big amounts. And so there must be some interactions between these compounds that we still truly don't understand how, it, how they work. Nice. I think we've we've touched on most of the questions that were in the Q and A box. I'm just going to check quickly to see if we miss anything. Um, it looks like we've covered most of them. I was going to ask one that's related to a question we didn't get to. Somebody brought up the idea of uh, what you know about pollination and and seed dispersal um, in Proteum in the species that you're working with. And I was going to ask kind of more. Broadly, the, the role of gene flow across this large region, and if you have different species of proteum that show different distributions, so like widespread species versus very patchily distributed, you know, isolated populations, and if you detect any differences between those groups of species. Yeah, so um, like I was saying, they have really small flowers, um, and I, my student, uh, former student Tracy Masewicz, she studied. Uh, she looked at, she had video um, on the flowers and she did some uh, trapping as well. And she found a lot of different species of bees, mostly, um, that were, you know, what we call generalist bees. Um, and she did find some differences across uh, white sand versus clay habitat, but um, definitely not a, like a very strong signal of specialization. Um, there are also some thrips that, that she found, the really tiny little insects. Um, so um, most of those, the bees that she found were stingless bees and very small ones. Um, I don't think that the, the incredible uh, kind of geographic distribution that you find in some of these species is probably not, um, the gene flow is probably not being driven by the pollinators as much as it might be by the dispersers um, because birds love proteum um, and monkeys, um, a lot of it, it kind of, you know, any arboreal animal um, but especially birds um, are really, really, um, you know, if, when there's fruiting proteum, the, you, you can hear it in the forest when you're walking because you hear this pat, 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 pat with seeds falling because all the animals come and eat it. They love to eat it. They're very high in uh, water and sugar content. Um, so again, a very generalized uh, relationship, but one that is probably driving um, some of the really large species distributions. There are uh, many species that live in the western Amazon and also the central Amazon. Um, a few species that can be also found in the eastern Amazon also, but generally you find a pattern where you, you either live in the eastern Amazon and in the central Amazon or the central Amazon and the western Amazon. Um, and then you do have a lot of local endemics, not just things like white sand specialists or Andean um, specialists, but sometimes just things that are only found in a very small geographic area. And um, that's a really major focus of um, Diego and I's uh, next project is to try to understand how relative abundance of these proteum species and geographic distribution is related to chemical diversity and the identities of the uh, pathogens and the herbivores that are attacking them. And so we're really excited about that because some of the, uh, some of the species of proteum are the hyper dominance, right? They're in the top you know, 10. I think proteum is number two in terms of the number of individuals per genus in the Amazon. And the, I think the top, there's two species or so in the top 10 or something like that. But there's also some really rare species. So I think it's a really good system for understanding um, kind of what's driving the commonness and rarity of uh, Amazonian tree species. And we're pretty excited about that. All right, then I'm going to ask a final kind of esoteric question here, and it, it was something that came to me as I was watching all your presentations. Um, first, when I was, you know, one of the things that came to me when I was watching Karina's is the fact that, you know, you have these, these depending on how disturbed an area might be, you're going to end up having different groups of caterpillars in, in different places. And as we all know, we're living in, a, you know, tropical forests are increasingly disturbed rather than what we might consider a kind of primary forest, right? We live in a disturbed tropical world. Um, the other the other question has to do with the issue that um, Diego and 
and Paul are interested in following up on in their next gra uh, grant, which is the question of what's going on below ground. Um, and this is something that, you know, pe people who study planar before interactions tend to work primarily with what's going on in the leaves. Um, I was really, really miserable for a while after Fabiani Munjing, who was a student in my lab, finished her dissertation, because it turns out that what she was finding is that if you have herbivory below ground, it completely changes the chemistry above ground. Um, and so a lot of the patterns that you observe thinking it's going on because of the experiments that you're imposing or the herbivores that you've excluded, it turns out it's just a bunch of nematodes that are doing it all. And so my question is, um, and we've got about four minutes left, maybe three for you to answer it is, is all our theory wrong? Are we in a world now where what we need to do is actually completely rethink kind of the theory that underpins the way we study these planar before interactions? Or are we looking at um, kind of special cases of that theory that's already there? Um, should we be comfortable with what we know or um, should we take it with a big grain of salt or silica maybe? I'm not sure which. I'm going to try to do it first before uh, Karina and Paul go forward that one. Um, so this is what I think. I think uh, we are very lucky that the effect that herbivores have above ground is strong enough that we can see it through the noise. Yes, that uh, what we see is just the tip of the iceberg, but what we found, it is real, but uh, every time we do uh, our regression and uh, analysis, we realize that the vast majority of the variation is not explained by the thing we're studying. We, we're lucky because it becomes, it, it isn't being, you know, significant, but it, it is not there. Uh, in, the, in the project where Paul and I, uh, I didn't try to identify all the compounds that were active against herbivores, we realized that only 18% of all the compounds we explore had any relationship with herbivores. Yes? And so the, the, the other 82, uh, what do they do? Uh, we don't know. We don't know what do they do, but uh, um, what I'm saying is that uh, we're lucky that these 18% these uh, were important enough to the fitness of the plants that they were selective uh, across the phylogeny and that we could see the effect uh, at the community level. But there's still too much uh, to literally uncover below ground, <laughs> yes, in terms of uh, species interactions. I don't know. And I would, I would just add that we have a snapshot or a tip of the iceberg, as just Diego said, and uh, that's great. But we have to be careful with generalizations and predictions, because that doesn't mean that we have the whole story to say this is happening or this will happen. So the lesson to me is that, uh, of course, things are, are much, much complex than, than we think that luckily through experimentation, we can sort of isolate some parts of the puzzle, but definitely we don't have the big picture, the entire picture of, of what, what, what is going on. So generalizations and predictive power of this information uh, needs to be taking, the limitations of it needs to be taken into account for me. And I agree with that. And, and I'll just end uh, by saying, we do know that biotic interactions are really important and <laughs> really fun to study. Yeah. <laughs> and there's much more to do. And uh, we want to thank uh, you, Liza and Emilio, for moderating. And um, thanks so much. We really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's we, it's we who thank you. I mean, really, it's, it's been fascinating. I scribbled all kinds of notes. I ran out of paper at one point, had to send a kid for more. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you all very much um, and the ATBC for helping us organize this. This, is, this has been really a wonderful experience and um, Liza working with you here as well. And I'm gonna get ready to show us a, a slide about our next one here. So I'm gonna let you feel the dead air for a moment here, Liza. Sure. Yeah, I just want to thank all of the speakers and Lucia, who's doing a lot of heavy lifting behind the scenes. And hopefully for all of you at home, eager to get back out into the forest, this has been a little dose of, of tropical forest ecology in your bedroom or laundry room or wherever you hide from the people you live with or... <laughs> or not, or just some connection and, and just a reminder to stay connected to ATBC. We're your 
network or your community, um, and hopefully these webinars are, are providing um, some inspiration and some hope during these times. And I think for, if you've never been to an ATBC meeting in person, I can tell you that it is a hugely friendly community and you should never, ha you should never hesitate to reach out to any of the speakers here, to me, to Emilio, to anyone within the ATBC community with your questions or with requests. Um, it's a very supportive community and um, we're happy that you're all part of it. And we have one more upcoming webinar um, on October 22nd on climate change, history, environment, and society um, with some excellent speakers. Um, again, that's next week. And for those of you that don't know, there have already been a number of other webinars that have taken place and those are all being posted on the ATVC YouTube channel. And I believe are all going to be available if they're not already up there, they, there will be, they will be available shortly, including ones on um, professional skills, science communication, um, special one on, on COVID-19 and wildlife. Um, so please check those out on the ATBC YouTube channel. And with that, I think I'll yeah. let Emilio take us home. Yeah, I was just gonna say our next webinar will be on October 22nd um, from three to five Eastern time in, uh, here in North America. Uh, it's on climate change, history, environment, and society. And the moderators are Ima Oliveras um, and Gabriel Colorado. And, and um, below that, I think you can see on your screen is um, where you can go to find out more information, the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation's webpage. Um, we, uh, I, I couldn't agree um, more with um, Liza. It's a wonderful organization. And uh, I thank you all for um, joining us today. It's been really wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to get in touch. For now, we're out. See you.